All right, my friends, we are up and running, and I am, whoops, let me make sure that mic is up high enough. I'm still Tad. Week after week, I remain Tad, despite all my attempts at finding another gig. So, since that's what I'm stuck with, that's what you're stuck with. And here I am, and it is now, oh, it's 101 because I was faffing about with a few things. It is one minute after 1 a.m. here on the west coast of America. And I hope you were all well. I hope you were all good. I hope you had a good weekend last weekend while I was doing other things um, that had to be done, <laughs> various and sundry, um, including a, a, a... No, it wasn't the baseball game during the weekend. It was something else. I can't remember what it was. It was a family thing of some kind that had to be done. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So I am here. Uh, I will give you a brief update on what's been going on, and then I will tell you what we're going to be reading and why, because there's very definitely a reason, well, two reasons, actually, for it. Um, the update on what's been going on is um, I have uh, finally got a chance to start um, The Splintered Sun, and I'm only a few pages into it, but it was like, you know, it's very much one of those things where until you break that ice, um, nothing moves. And then you break the ice and things begin to move. So just the fact of getting the first few pages written means that already you're starting to solve problems. Problems of approach, problems of voice, problems of uh, construction, mechanics. You know, how are we telling the story? What's the viewpoint? Um, are we telling it with the character's thoughts that we're focusing on, or are we telling it from a more uh, distant point of view, a more uh, overarching godlike narrator point of view, et cetera, et cetera. So just the fact of breaking that wall of actually starting to write things makes all kinds of things happen. So I'm very happy to be doing that. At the same time, I'm still signing a zillion tip-in sheets and things like that that have to be done. And as you can see behind me, the office is still very, very sad. But that actually plays into what I'm going to talk about in just a moment. So uh, anything else to describe? Everybody else well? Um, wife Deborah sleeping the sleep of the just upstairs. Um, daughter has just come down to mess about with the cats for a while and then gone out. Cats will be making little rattly noises behind us. Behind me, not behind you, so, but behind us in the royal sense, I guess, because the I have just put some treats in the cat box. Um, you can see the corner of it way down, whoops, right down here. That is the corner of the little treat box. Um, that will keep them occupied instead of having some cat fight like they did last night. Thank God I wasn't on last night trying to do a reading because they stepped in their food bowls and made a hideous clattering noise and spilled dry food all over the floor while they were having a, you know, a run around. Ah, animals. Um, everybody else fine, dogs fine, cats fine. Um, so nothing much to report. Had a nice night. Um, had a family dinner thing. All good. So... That's that stuff mentioned. Um, nothing else specifically to talk about in terms of any work-related things, uh, since I told you the only significant part, which was that I've finally started actually writing on Splintered Sun. Um, the, uh, now, what I wanted to talk about is what I'm going to be reading. And what I'm going to be reading for actually the next few weeks is not a science fiction story or stories, but is in fact... From this book here, our family copy of The Wind in the Willows. And there are several reasons for that, but I will explain them to you. The first reason is that as I've been going through short stories that were interesting to me, informative to me, I realized that I am going through an incredible amount of stress because almost all the books of all my favorite stories are still packed away and I haven't been able to find most of them yet. So what I've been doing over the past couple of weeks or so is been buying 
new versions, mostly digital versions, of some of those writers' stories, whatever I could get in digital form. Um, and as a result, I've been having to read a lot of uh, stories by those writers that are ones that I don't know whether I'd want to read or not, as opposed to the ones that I know well that were actually formative to me. So because of this and of various other things I'll explain in a moment, I have decided I really want, before I start trying to read stories, which are complicated to read anyway because they're all different lengths, they're much harder to judge than reading from a novel. Um, because of that, I really want to wait until I can find my books where I've got all the ones that I know I want to read. For instance, I know I've got several James Tiptree stories, and although I've found some other James Tiptree stories, they're not the ones that I've been influential on me, and that is what I would prefer to read. Same thing with Bradbury, same thing with Zelazny, um, Sturgeon, all of these folks. So rather than reading a novel from each of them uh, or something like that to, to deal with that problem, I'm going to put them aside for a little while until I can actually locate my books, which will happen. All these things are slowly getting dealt with. And so as a result, I decided, well, I would read something else. And instead of going through the struggle of trying to find stories, find stories the right length, find stories that... I, you know, get copies of the stories by buying them again and not always being able to do that because not all of them are available in digital form um, and having to like reorder paperbacks that I already own, that is just really too frustrating for me. So, especially because I've been carting these damn things around since I was a teenager, many of them. And the idea of having to go out and buy another copy now just to replace the one that I know I have. And some of them I have two or three copies of that have kind of wound up with me over the years. So that's too frustrating for words. So I'm going to read instead from a book that was extremely formative for me in many, many ways. And I hope you will bear with me. The other reason that I want to, that I'm going to read The Wind in the Willows to you, yeah, well, a couple of other reasons. One of them is just it's a damn well-written book. Um, it's beautifully written. For those of you, especially those of you who are not in England, uh, you and, and may not have actually heard it before. You may have seen uh, dramatization, you know, I mean, like the Disney dramatization or something, which is, you know, basically they made it all about Mr. Toad, who's an important character, but it's not the story. Um, and uh, But it's also, it's just a beautifully written book. It is also one that's interesting to discuss, as I will mention at some point, um, because it's part of the great English tradition of bachelor characters. Uh, Kenneth Graham and many others. Kenneth Graham wrote The Wind in the Willows, but many of these stories are basically, I mean, to an extent, The Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit. You know, they're bachelor stories. They're stories written by men with mostly male characters. But... The difference with Wind in the Willows is they're animals. <laughs> so there's enough animal stuff in terms of characterizing them that we don't miss female characters quite as much as we might in another sort of type of bachelor fiction as it was. But the most important reason and the reason I want to share this book is because in uh, six or seven days, six days, we are having a uh, memorial for my parents or a celebration of life for my parents. And this book was always one of the most important to me because it was one of the firmest and strongest memories I have of being read to as a child by my mother. And also then I, I took the book when she was in the hospital in her last couple of weeks when at first we didn't know, you know, it, we thought she might be coming back home again if they could figure out what was going on with her. Um, but I read parts of it to her because it was a strong bond and, and, you know, she was bedridden and on oxygen and stuff and couldn't really hold any books or anything herself. And I thought, well, you know, I'll, I'll go in and read to her. So it, it's, it's an important book for me in a lot of ways. It kind of first opened up for me the idea of worlds just beyond our world that you know worlds that we can't see unless somebody takes us to the door as it were which is of course a great deal of 
not just animal fiction by any means, but magic realism, you know? I mean, the entire catalog of Neil Gaiman's work, for instance, is sort of based on that kind of an idea. <clears throat> Many other writers, too, over a very, very long period of time have used that idea of there is a world just beyond what we know. And in the case of The Wind in the Willows, it's the world of the river and the woods and the world of animals. All those, these animals act a lot like, as I mentioned before, British, British bachelors. But it's a beautiful book, nevertheless, and very funny and, and enjoyable in places. And the writing is really fine. And, and oftentimes it's something I don't hear people talk about. So I wanted to share it with you um, and you can hear some of what I heard and, and perhaps see some of what I saw. Even as a kid, that led me down the path that eventually was to making my own stories and sharing them with people. So, um, and, and as I said, and this is also very much a reason, it's a very sentimental connection between my mother and myself. And along with some of the other things she read to me, really set me out on the path of wanting to be a writer. She was also the person who, when I was about 10 or 11 years old, gave me the Lord of the Rings and said, you know, this might be your kind of thing. And that set me off on years and years and years of, of uh, fantasy reading and, and things like that. So obviously she was right. It was my kind of thing. Um, anyway, so that's what's going on. I'm gonna read The Wind in the Willows. I will try to show you pictures when I can. Um, I, if, I could, if I had this all set up correctly, um, I, will, I would be able to just put them up on the screen, but I haven't figured out how to do that. Um, so what we have instead is we have, I can hold things up every now and then. Um, like this is the map in the, at the beginning of the book. And if you want to come back and look at it again, you can just pause, you can pause this and come back and look. Um, but that is the world of the wind and the willows, the volume that I have in, and this is our family volume. Um, it was illustrated by Ernest Shepard, who to my mind is the single best, um, illustrator of children's books um, uh, in my lifetime. And he also, of course, did the famous uh, Winnie the Pooh, House of Pooh Corner books by A.A. A. Milne and basically uh, created the Winnie the Pooh characters before Disney got a hold of them that we all knew um, and, and what, they, what they were and what, how they were supposed to look and the feeling that they put off, which was a lot more subtle than the Disney version. And the same thing is true for Ernest Shepard with the um, uh, Wind of the Willows as well. Now, other, there, I think there had been a previous Ill illustrated edition of the book before Shepard got a hold of it, but I'm not certain about that. Anyway, let me see if I can get myself back in focus here. Hello, I'm back here. See, follow my hand. Eh, it doesn't want to. Well, I'll see if it does it on its own then. But anyway, so, and I will try to remember from time to time to show you pictures because Ernest Shepard's pictures are one of the finest things about this book and it's a very fine book. So, before I start, here's the first chapter called The River Bank and that is a picture of the mole. And the mole is, looks like he's whitewashing his ceiling. Um, before I read that though, I am going to go check in and see if anybody has shown up any gluttons for punishment who might happen to have come on board. Um, and let us see who we've got here. Uh, okay, so checked in so far, Suzanne. Hello, Suzanne. Iris, Cliff, Hazel, that's my mother-in-law. Hello, sweetie. Your daughter is here safe, fine, happy, sleeping. Um, good to see you, love to the family. Uh, Kristen is here. Isaac, hello. Isaac, hello. Dirk, Tracy, that's Tracy McClatchy. Winter, hello, Winter. Wouter is here. Chris, Herr Fab, good to see you, sir. Rosalba, Sandra, Christy, that's Christy Sanders. Mark, Redmond, Nicole, Carol, and Penny are at least some of the ones who've commented so far. If I've missed anybody, I'll try and catch you before the end of the 
broadcast. Um, so anyway, yes. So this is, a, a, as mentioned, this is a, a deeply sentimental book for me. But um, for anybody who's interested in the processes that, that led, led me down the particular garden path, that's fairly accurate and, and appropriate. For anybody who's interested in the processes that led me down the garden path, um, that is why I'm reading this also. So both sentiment and professional interest as well. Okay, so we are reading from The Wind in the Willows by Kenneth Graham. This is a Scribner's edition. So this is, I can probably even find out when this was published. 1961. Yeah, 1961. So that makes sense because my mom was reading it to me when I was quite young. Okay, The Wind in the Willows, Chapter 1, The Riverbank. The mole had been working very hard all the morning, spring cleaning his little home. First with brooms, then with dusters, then on ladders and steps and chairs, with a brush and a pail of whitewash till he had dust in his throat and eyes and splashes of whitewash all over his black fur and an aching back and weary arms. Spring was moving in the air above and in the earth below and around him, penetrating even his dark and lowly little house with its spirit of divine discontent and longing. It was a small wonder then that he suddenly flung down his brush on the floor, said, bother, and oh, blow, and also, hang spring cleaning, and bolted out of the house without even waiting to put on his coat. Something up above was calling him imperiously, and he made for the steep little tunnel, which answered, in his case, to the graveled carriage drive owned by animals whose residences are nearer to the sun and air. So he scraped and scratched and scrabbled and scrooged, and then he scrooged again and scrabbled and scratched and scraped, working busily with his little paws and muttering to himself, up we go, up we go, till at last, pop, his snout came out into the sunlight and he found himself rolling in the warm glass, grass of a great meadow. This is fine, he said to himself, this is better than whitewashing. The sunshine struck hot on his fur, soft breezes caressed his heated brow, and after the seclusion of the cellarage he had lived in so long, the carol of happy birds fell on his dulled hearing almost like a shout, jumping off all his four legs at once. In the joy of living and the delight of spring, without its cleaning, he pursued his way across the meadow till he reached the hedge on the further side. And there is a picture of the mole leaping. And I can see that focus is going to be an issue. Hold up, said an elderly rabbit at the gap. Sixpence for the privilege of passing by the private road. He was bowled over in an instant by the impatient and contemptuous mole, who trotted along the side of the hedge, chaffing the other rabbits as they peeped hurriedly from their holes to see what the row was about. Onion sauce! Onion sauce! He remarked jeeringly, and was gone before they could think of a thoroughly satisfactory reply. Then they all started grumbling at each other. How stupid you are. Why didn't you tell him? Well, why didn't you say? You might have reminded him, and so on in the usual way. But, of course, it was then much too late, as is always the case. It all seemed too good to be true. Hither and thither through the meadows he rambled busily along the hedgerows, across the copses, finding everywhere birds building, flowers budding, leaves thrusting, everything happy and progressive and occupied. And instead of having an uneasy conscience pricking him and whispering, whitewash, he somehow could feel only how jolly it was to be the only idle dog among all these busy citizens. After all, the best part of a holiday is perhaps not so much to be resting yourself as to see all the other fellows busily working. He thought his happiness was complete when, as he meandered aimlessly along, suddenly he stood by the edge of a full-fed river. 
Never in his life had he seen a river before. This sleek, sinuous, full-bodied animal, chasing and chuckling, gripping things with a gurgle and leaving them with a laugh to fling itself on fresh playmates that shook themselves free and were caught and held again. All a shake, all was a shake and a shiver. Glints and gleams and sparkles, rustle and swirl, chatter and bubble. The mole was bewitched, entranced, fascinated. By the side of the river he trotted as one trots, when very small, by the side of a man who holds one spellbound by exciting stories. And when tired at last, he sat on the bank, while the river still chattered on to him, a babbling procession of the best stories in the world, sent from the heart of the earth to be told at last to the insatiable sea. As he sat on, the, sat on the grass and looked across the river, a dark hole in the bank opposite, just above the water's edge, caught his eye, and dreamily he fell to considering what a nice, snug dwelling place it would make for an animal with few wants and fond of a bijou riverside residence above flood level and remote from noise and dust. And here's a picture on this side of the mole looking enviously, whoops, there's the mole looking enviously at a bijou. Whoops, how can I get that forward? Oh, I'm looking at the wrong side. A bijou waterside residence, okay. As he gazed, something bright and small seemed to twinkle down in the heart of it, vanished, then twinkled once more, <coughs> like a tiny star. But it could hardly be a star in such. <coughs> excuse me. But it could hardly be a star in such an unlikely situation, and it was too glittering and small for a glowworm. Then, as he looked, it winked at him, and so declared itself to be an eye, and a small face began gradually to grow up round it, like a frame around a picture. A brown little face, with whiskers. A grave, round face with the same twinkle in its eye that had first attracted his notice. Small, neat ears and thick, silky hair. It was the water rat. Then the two animals stood and regarded each other cautiously. Hello, mole, said the water rat. Hello, rat, said the mole. Would you like to come over, inquired the rat presently. Oh, it's all very well to talk, said the mole, rather pettishly, he being new to a river and riverside life and its ways. The rat said nothing, but stooped and unfastened a rope and hauled on it, then lightly stepped into a little boat which the mole had not observed. It was painted blue outside and white within and was just the size for two animals, and the mole's whole heart went out to it at once, even though he did not yet fully understand its uses. The rat sculled smartly across and made fast. Then he held up his forepaw as the mole stepped gingerly down. Lean on that, he said. Now then, step lively. And the mole, to his surprise and rapture, found himself actually seated in the stern of a real boat. This has been a wonderful day, said he, as the rat shoved off and took to the skulls again. Do you know I've never been in a boat before in all my life? What? cried the rat open mouthed. Ne never been in a. You ne what? What have you been doing then? Is it so nice as all that? asked the mole shyly, though he was quite prepared to believe it as he leant back in his seat and surveyed the cushions, the oars, the rowlocks and all the fascinating, fascinating fittings and felt the boat sway lightly under him. Nice! It's the only thing, said the water rat solemnly as he leaned forward for his stroke. Believe me, my young friend, there is nothing, absolutely nothing, half so much worth doing as simply messing about in boats. Simply messing, he went on dreamily. Messing about in boats. Messing. Look ahead, rat, 
cried the mole suddenly. It was too late. The boat struck the bank full tilt. The dreamer, the joyous oarsman, lay on his back at the bottom of the boat, his heels in the air. About in boats, or with boats, the rat went on composedly, picking himself up with a pleasant laugh. In or out of them, doesn't matter. Nothing seems really to matter. That's the charm of it. Whether you get away or whether you don't, whether you arrive at your destination or whether you reach somewhere else or whether you never get anywhere at all, you're always busy and you never do anything in particular. And when you've done it, there's always something else to do. And you can do it if you like, but you'd much better not. Look here, if you've really got nothing else on hand this morning, suppose we drop down the river together and have a long day of it. The mole waggled his toes from sheer happiness, spread his chest with a sigh of full contentment, and leaned back blissfully into the soft cushions. What a day I'm having, he said. Let us start at once. Hold hard a minute, then, said the rat. He looped the painter through a ring in his landing stage, climbed up into his hole above, and after a short interval reappeared, staggering under a fat wicker luncheon basket. And there's Mole uh, receiving the luncheon basket from Rat, and here is Rat and Mole in the boat. Shove that under your feet he observed to the mole as he passed it down into the boat. Then he untied the painter and took the skulls again. What's inside it? asked the mole, wiggling with curiosity. There's a uh, cold chicken inside it, replied the rat briefly. Cold tongue, cold ham, cold beef, pickled uh, gherkin salad, French rolls, and sandwiches, spotted meat, Sandwiches, potted meat, ginger beer, lemonade, soda water. Oh, stop, stop, cried the mole in ecstasies. This is too much. Do you really think so, inquired the rat seriously. It's only what I take on these little excursions, and the other animals are always telling me that I'm a mean beast and cut it very fine. The mole never heard a word he was saying. Absorbed in the new life he was entering upon, intoxicated with the sparkle, the ripple, the scents, and the sounds, and the sunlight, he trailed a paw in the water and dreamed long, waking dreams. The water rat, like the good little fellow he was, sculled steadily on and forbore to disturb him. "'I like your clothes awfully, old chap,' he remarked after some half an hour or so had passed." I'm going to get a black velvet smoking suit myself some day, as soon as I can afford it. I, I beg your pardon, said the mole, pulling himself together with an effort. You must think me very rude, but all this is so new to me. So this is a river. The river, corrected the rat. And you really live by the river. What a jolly life. By it, and with it, and on it, and in it, said the rat. It's brother and sister to me, and ants, and company, and food, and drink, and naturally washing. It's my world, and I don't want any other. What it hasn't got is not worth having, and what it doesn't know is not worth knowing. Lord, the times we've had together, whether in winter or summer, spring or autumn, it's always got its fun and its excitements. When the floods are on in February and my cellars and basement are brimming with drink that's no good to me and the brown water runs by my best bedroom window or, or again when it all drops away and shows patches of mud that smells like plum cake and the rushes and weed clog the channels and I can pat potter about dry shod over most of the bed of it and find fresh food to eat, and things careless people have dropped out of boats. But isn't it a bit dull at times? The mole ventured to ask. You just, you and the river, and no one else to pass a word with. No one else to... Well, I mustn't be hard on you, said the rat with forbearance. 
You're new to it, and of course you don't know. The bank is so crowded nowadays that many people are moving away altogether. Oh, no, it isn't what it used to be at all. Otters, kingfishers, dab chicks, moorhens, all of them about all day long and always wanting you to do something, as if a fellow had no business of his own to attend to. What lies over there? asked the mole, waving a paw towards a background of woodland that darkly framed the water meadows on one side of the river. That? Oh, that's just the wild wood, said the rat shortly. We don't go there very much, we river bankers. Aren't, aren't, they, aren't they very nice people in there? said the mole a trifle nervously. Well, replied the rat, let me see, the squirrels are all right, and the rabbits, some of them, but rabbits are a mixed lot. And then there's Badger, of course, he lives right in the heart of it. Wouldn't live anywhere else either if you paid him to do it. Dear old Badger, nobody interferes with him. They'd better not, he added significantly. Why, who should interfere with him? asked the mole. Well, of course, there are, there are others, explained the rat in a hesitating sort of way. Weasels and stoats and foxes and so on. They're all right, in a way. I'm very good friends with them, past the time of day when we meet and all that, but they break out sometimes. There's no denying it, and then, well, you can't really trust them, and that's the fact. The mole knew well that it is quite against animal etiquette to dwell on possible trouble ahead or even to allude to it, so he dropped the subject. And behind, beyond the wild wood again, he asked, where it's all blue and dim and one sees what may be hills, or perhaps they mayn't, and something like the smoke of towns, or, or is it only cloud drift? Beyond the wild wood comes the wide world, said the rat, and that's something that doesn't matter, either to you or me. I've never been there, and I'm never going, nor you either, if you've got any sense at all. Don't ever refer to it again, please. Now then, here's our backwater at last, where we're going to lunch. Leaving the main stream, they now passed into what seemed at first sight like a little landlocked lake. Green turf sloped down to either edge. Brown, snaky tree roots gleamed below the surface of the quiet water, while ahead of them the silvery shoulder and foamy tumble of a weir, arm in arm with a restless, dripping mill wheel that held up in its turn a gray-gabled mill house, filled the air with a soothing murmur of sound dull and smothery, yet with little clear voices speaking up cheerfully out of it at intervals. It was so very beautiful that Mole could only hold up both forepaws and gasp, Oh my! Oh my! Oh my! The rat brought the boat alongside the bank, made her fast, helped the still awkward Mole safely ashore, and swung out the lunch ba luncheon basket. And there is Mole unpacking the luncheon basket. The Mole begged as a favor to be allowed to unpack it all by himself, and the Rat was very pleased to indulge him and to sprawl at full length on the grass and rest while his excited friend shook out the tablecloth and spread it, took out all the mysterious packets one by one and arranged their contents in due order, still gasping, Oh my! Oh, my, at each fresh revelation. When all was ready, the rat said, Now pitch in, old fellow. And the mole was indeed very glad to obey, for he had started his spring cleaning at a very early hour that morning, as people will do, and had not paused for bite or sup, and he had been through a very great deal since that distant time, which now seemed so many days ago. What are you looking at? said the rat presently, when the edge of their hunger was somewhat dulled. And there is, whoops, sorry, I'm still figuring out how to do this. There is Mole reclining on the riverbank after having eaten quite a bit. Uh, 
come here. My pages are stuck together. And the once the oh sorry so when the edge of their hunger was somewhat dulled and the mole's eyes were able to wander off the tablecloth a little. I am looking, said the mole, at a streak of bubbles that I see traveling along the surface of the water. That is a thing that strikes me as funny. Bubbles, oh, ho, said the rat, and chirruped cheerily in an inviting sort of way. A broad, glistening muzzle showed itself above the edge of the bank, and the otter hauled himself out and shook the water from his coat. Greedy beggars, he observed, making for the provender. Why didn't you invite me, ratty? This was an impromptu affair, explained the rat. By the way, my friend, Mr. Mole. Proud, I'm sure, said the otter, and the two animals were friends forthwith. Such a rumpus everywhere! continued the otter. All the world seems out on the river today. I came up this backwater to try and get a moment's peace and, and stumble upon you fellas. At least, oh, I beg pardon, don't exactly mean that, you know. There was a rustle behind them, proceeding from a hedge wherein last year's leaves still clung thick, and a stripy head with high shoulders behind it peered forth on them. Come on, old badger, shouted the rat. The badger trotted forward a pace or two, then grunted, mm, Company! and turned his back and disappeared from view. That's just the sort of fellow he is, observed the disappointed rat. Simply hates society. Now we shan't see any more of him today. Well, tell us who's out on the river. Toad's out, for one, replied the otter, in his brand new wager boat. New togs, new everything. The two animals looked at each other and laughed. And before we go to that, there's the otter. Whoops. There is the water rat. And whoops, there is Mr. Toad out in his wager boat. The two animals looked at each other and laughed. Once it was nothing but sailing, said the rat. Then he tired of that and took to punting. Nothing would please him but to punt all day and every day, and a nice mess he made of it. Last year it was houseboating, and we all had to go and stay with him in his houseboat and pretend we liked it. He was going to spend the rest of his life in a houseboat. It's all the same. Whatever he takes up, he gets tired of it and starts on something fresh. Such a good fella, too, remarked the otter reflectively, but no stability, especially in a boat. From where they sat, they could get a glimpse of the main stream across the island that separated them, and just then a wager boat flashed into view. The rower, a short, stout figure, splashing badly and rolling a good deal, but working his hardest. The rat stood up and hailed him, but Toad, for it was he, shook his head and settled sternly to his work. He'll be out of the boat in a minute if he rolls like that, said the rat, sitting down again. Of course he will, chuckled the otter. Did I ever tell you that good story about Toad and the lock keeper? <laughs> it happened this way. Toad an errant mayfly swerved unsteadily athwart the current in the intoxicated fashion affected by young bloods of mayflies seeing life. A swirl of water and a cloop, and the mayfly was visible no more. Neither was the otter. The mole looked down. The voice was still in his ears, but the turf whereon he had sprawled was clearly vacant, not an otter to be seen as far as the distant horizon. But again, there was a streak of bubbles on the surface of the river. The rat hummed a tune, and the mole recollected that animal etiquette forbade any sort of comment on the sudden disappearance of one's friends at any moment for any reason or no reason whatever. Well, well said the rat. I suppose we ought to be moving. I wonder which of us had better pack the luncheon basket. He did not speak as if he was frightfully eager for the treat. Oh, please, let me, 
said the mole. So, of course, the rat led him. Packing the basket was not quite such pleasant work as unpacking the basket. It never is. But the mole was bent on enjoying everything, and although just when he had got the basket packed and strapped up tightly, he saw a plate staring up at him from the grass. And when the job had been done again, the rat pointed out a fork, which anybody ought to have seen, and last of all, behold, the mustard pot, which he had been sitting on without knowing it. Still, somehow, the thing got finished at last without much loss of temper. The afternoon sun was getting low as the rat sculled gently homewards in a dreamy mood, murmuring poetry things over to himself and not paying much attention to Mole. But the Mole was very full of lunch and self-satisfaction and pride and already quite at home in a boat, so he thought, and was getting a bit restless besides, and presently he said, Ratty, please, I want to row now. The rat shook his head with a smile. Not yet, my young friend, he said. Wait till you've had a few lessons. It's not so easy as it looks. The mole was quiet for a minute or two, but he began to feel more and more jealous of rats sculling so strongly and so easily along, and his pride began to whisper that he could do it every bit as well. He jumped up and seized the skulls so suddenly that the rat, who was gazing out over the water and saying more poetry things to himself, was taken by surprise and fell backward off his seat with his legs in the air for the second time, while the triumphant mole took his place and grabbed the skulls with entire confidence. "'Stop it, you silly ass!' cried the rat from the bottom of the boat. "'You can't do it. You'll have us over.' <coughs> <coughs> The mole flung his skulls back with a flourish and made a great dig at the water. He missed the surface altogether. His legs flew up above his head, and he found himself lying on top of the prostrate rat. Greatly alarmed, he made a grab at the side of the boat, and the next moment, sploosh, over went the boat, and he found himself struggling in the river. Oh, my, how cold the water was, and oh, how very wet it felt, how it sang in his ears as he went down, 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 how bright and welcome the sun looked as he rose to the surface, coughing and spluttering, how black was his despair when he felt himself sinking again. Then a firm paw gripped him by the back of his neck. It was the rat, and he was evidently laughing. The mole could feel him laughing right down his arm and through his paw, and so into his, the mole's, neck. And here is a picture of the rat pulling the mole out of the river. The rat got hold of a skull and shoved... By the way, I should mention for some of my people for whom English is uh, second or even third language... Skull, in this case, is S-C-U-L-L, -L, and it's an old word for, or a, a specific word for uh, oar, for a type of oar um, for rowing, obviously. You probably figured that out from context, but just wanted to make sure. The rat got hold of a skull and shoved it under the mole's arm. Then he did the same by the other side of him and, swimming behind, propelled the helpless animal to shore, hauled him out, and set him down on the bank, a squashy, pulpy lump of misery. When the rat had rubbed him down a bit and wrung some of the wet out of him, he said, Now then, old fellow, trot up and down the towing path as hard as you can till you're warm and dry again, while I dive for the luncheon basket. So the dismal mole, wet without and ashamed within, trotted about till he was fairly dry, while the rat plunged into the water again, recovered the boat, righted her, and made her fast, fetched his floating property to shore by degrees, and finally dived successfully for the luncheon basket and struggled to land with it. When all was ready for a start once more, the mole, limp and dejected, took his seat in the stern of the boat, and as they set off, he said, in a low voice broken with emotion, Ratty, my generous friend, I am very sorry indeed for my foolish and ungrateful conduct. 
my heart quite fails me when I think how I might have lost that beautiful luncheon basket. Indeed, I have been a complete ass, and I know it. Will you overlook it this once and forgive me and let things go on as before? That's all right, bless you, responded the rat cheerily. What's a little wet to a water rat? I'm more in the water than out of it most days. Don't you think any more about it. And look here, I really think you had better come and stop with me for a little time. It's very plain and rough, you know, not like Toad's house at all, but you haven't seen that yet. Still, I can make you comfortable, and I'll teach you how to row and to swim, and you'll soon be as handy on the water as any of us. The mole was so touched by his kind manner of speaking that he could find no voice to answer him, and he had to brush away a tear or two with the back of his paw. But the rat kindly looked in another direction, and presently the mole's spirits revived again, and he was even able to give some straight back talk to a couple of moor hens who were sniggering to each other about his bedraggled appearance. When they got home, the rat made a bright fire in the parlor and planted the mole in an armchair in front of it, having fetched down a dressing gown and slippers for him, and told him river stories till supper time. Very thrilling stories they were, too, to an earth-dwelling animal like Mole. Stories about weirs and sudden floods and leaping pike and steamers that flung hard bottles. At least bottles were certainly flung, and from steamers, so presumably by them. And about herons and how particular they were whom they spoke to. And about adventures down drains and night fishings with otter or excursions far afield with badger. Supper was a most cheerful meal, but very shortly afterwards a terribly sleepy mole had to be escorted upstairs by his considerate host to the best bedroom, where he soon laid his head on his pillow in great peace and contentment, knowing that his new-found friend the river was lapping the sill of his window. This day was only the first of many similar ones for the emancipated mole, each of them longer and fuller of interest as the ripening summer moved onward. He learnt to swim and to row and entered into the joy of running water, and with his ear to the reed stems he caught at intervals something of what the wind went whispering so constantly among them. And there is a picture of the mole going upstairs to bed at Rat's house. Okay, I'm going to start chapter two. Chapter two, The Open Road. Ratty, said the mole suddenly one bright summer morning, if you please, I, I want to ask you a favor. The rat was sitting on the riverbank singing a little song. He had just composed it himself, so he was very taken up with it and would not pay proper attention to Mole or anything else. Since early morning, he had been swimming in the river in company with his friends, the ducks. And when the ducks stood on their heads suddenly, as ducks will, he would dive down and tickle their necks just under where their chins would be, if ducks had chins, till they were forced to come to the surface again in a hurry, spluttering and angry and shaking their feathers at him, for it is impossible to say quite all you feel when your head is under water. At last they implored him to go away and attend to his own affairs and leave them to mind theirs. So the rat went away and sat on the river bank in the sun and made up a song about them, which he called Duck's Ditty. All along the backwater, through the rushes tall, ducks are a-dabbling tails all, duck's tails, drake's tails, yellow feet a-quiver, yellow bills all out of sight, busy in the river. Slushy green undergrowth where the roach swim, here we keep our larder, cool and full and dim. Everyone for what he likes, we like to be, heads down, tails up, dabbling free. High in the blue above, swifts whirl and call. We are down a-dabbling, up 
tails all. I don't know that I think so very much of that little song, Rat, observed the Mole cautiously. He was no poet himself and didn't care who knew it, and he had a candid nature. Nor don't the ducks neither, replied the Rat cheerfully. They say... Why can't fellows be allowed to do what they like, when they like, and as they like, instead of other fellows sitting on banks and watching them all the time and making remarks and poetry and things about them? What nonsense it all is. That's what the ducks say. So it is. So it is, said the mole with great heartiness. No, it isn't, cried the rat indignantly. Well, then it isn't. It isn't replied the Mole soothingly. But what I wanted to ask you was, won't you take me to call on Mr. Toad? I've heard so much about him, and I do so want to make his acquaintance. Why, certainly, said the good-natured rat, jumping to his feet and dismissing poetry from his mind for the day. Get the boat out, and we'll paddle up there at once. It's never the wrong time to call on Toad. Early or late, he's always the same fellow. Always good-tempered, always glad to see you, always sorry when you go. He must be a very nice animal, observed the Mole as he got into the boat and took the skulls while the Rat settled himself comfortably in the stern. He is indeed the best of animals, replied Rat. So simple, so good-natured, and so affectionate. Perhaps he's not very clever. We, we can't all be geniuses, and it may be that he is both boastful and conceited. But he has got some great qualities, has Toady. Rounding a bend in the river, they came in sight of a handsome, dignified old house of mellowed red brick, <coughs> with well-kept lawns reaching down to the water's edge. There's Toad Hall, said the rat, and that creek on the left, where the notice board says private, no landing allowed, leads to his boathouse, where we'll leave the boat. Stables are over there to the right. That's the banqueting hall you're looking at now. Very old, that is. Toad is rather rich, you know, and this is really one of the nicest houses in these parts. Though we never admit as much to Toad. And here is a picture of... Rat and Mole approaching Toad Hall, and there is the master of Toad Hall thinking deeply about something. They glided up the creek, and the Mole shipped his skulls as they passed into the shadows of a large boathouse. Here they saw many handsome boats slung from the cross beams or hauled up on a slip, but none in the water, and the place had an unused and deserted air. The rat looked around him. I understand, said he. Boating is played out. He's tired of it and done with it. I wonder what new fad he's taken up now. Come along and let's look him up. We shall hear all about it quite soon enough. They disembarked and strolled across the gay flower-decked lawns <coughs> in search of Toad whom they presently happened upon, resting in a wicker garden chair with a preoccupied expression of face and a large map spread out on his knees. Hooray! he cried, jumping up, and see uh, jumping up on seeing them. This is splendid! He shook the paws of both of them warmly, never waiting for an introduction to the mole. How kind of you, he went on, dancing round them. I was just going to send a boat down the river for you, Ratty, with strict orders that you were to be fetched up here at once, whatever you were doing. I want you badly, both of you. Now, what will you take? Come inside and have something. You don't know how lucky it is you're turning up just now. Uh, let's sit quiet a bit, Toady said the rat, throwing himself into an easy chair while the mole took another by the side of him and made some civil remark about Toad's delightful residence. Finest house on the whole river, cried Toad boisterously. Or anywhere else for that matter, he could not help adding. Here the rat nudged the mole. Unfortunately, the Toad saw him do it and turned very red. There was a moment's painful silence, 
Then Toad burst out laughing. All right, Ratty, he said. It's only my way, you know. It's not such a very bad house, is it? You know you rather like it yourself. Now, look here. Let's be sensible. You are the very animals I wanted. You've got to help me. It's most important. It's about your rowing, I suppose, said the rat with an innocent air. You're getting on fairly well, although you splash a good bit still. With a great deal of patience and any quantity of coaching, you may... Oh, poo, boating, interrupted the toad in great disgust. Silly, boyish amusement. I've given that up long ago. Sheer waste of time, that's what it is. It makes me downright sorry to see you fellows who ought to know better spending all your energies in that aimless manner. No, I've discovered the real thing, the only genuine occupation for a lifetime. I, I propose to devote the remainder of mine to it and can only regret the wasted years that lie behind me, squandered in trivialities. Come with me, dear Ratty, and your amiable friend also, if you will be so very good, just as far as the stable yard, and you shall see what you shall see. He led the way to the stable yard accordingly, the rat following with a most mistrustful expression, and there, drawn out of the coach house into the open, they saw a gypsy caravan, shining with newness, painted a canary yellow picked out with green and red wheels. And there it is. There you are, cried the toad, straddling and expanding himself. There's real life for you, embodied in that little cart. The open road, the dusty highway, the heath, the common, the hedgerows, the rolling downs, camps, villages, towns, cities. Here today, up and off to somewhere else tomorrow. Travel, change, interest, excitement. The whole world before you and a horizon that's always changing. Uh, and mind, this is the very finest cart of its sort that was ever built, without any exception. Come inside and look at the arrangements. Planned them all myself, I did. And I think that's where we're going to stop for tonight before we get deep into the... Whoops! Before we get deep into the so-called gypsy caravan or whatever we call it here. And yes, I am aware that gypsy is no longer a term that we find uh, acceptable to speak of people, but the book was written back in the early 1900s. Um, anyway, so uh, I will continue with um, Wind in the Willows tomorrow night, obviously. Um, and if it's okay with you guys, I mean, you can certainly tell me. Um, I'm very, very interested to hear what people think. So if anybody has uh, any problem with the Wind in the Willows or want to, you know, make suggestions for other things in the future that I can read, um, I, I do have many reasons, as I said, for, for deciding to read this now. And if you've just tuned in, I explained it all at the beginning. Um, but anyway, so that is where we are at. I thank you so much for joining me. As always, it's a huge pleasure to spend time with you. I hope you will continue to take good care of yourselves and good care of your loved ones and friends and neighbors and, you know, just help out wherever you can. Um, and I will see some of you at 7 p.m. later today. And I will see the rest of you perhaps next week in this same time slot. Um, one way or the other, though, we will meet up again. So, again, thanks, peace, and good night, or good morning, depending.